Um, you know, we, usually when we give lightning talks, uh, they're sort of like centered around an artifact or a piece of gear or something like that. These are really valuable. You got to have those, right? Um, I feel like um, talks about craftsmanship as a whole are generally speaking a little bit underrepresented, just because um, there's probably a lot of reasons for it. Um, they're harder to approach without them blowing up in size. Um, they're in some ways less accessible for folks who are really brand new, but they're valuable. Um, there's sometimes opinion in there, right? There's people who disagree about the best way to sort of like take all these pieces and put them together. So I'm saying this because um, I want you to temper this talk with that sort of like vision. Like this is this is stuff we've learned at our shop, right? I mean, there will be some best practices in here that aren't my ideas. People like uh, you know Bob Martin and Rich Hickey, uh, Kyle Simpson, Addy Osmandy. Like I didn't come up with all this stuff. Um, but our shop did take the time to sort of like learn from these folks and kind of composite them and it's something that worked really well for us. And um, I, so this is my opinion, right? But I believe very strongly in this. Like I, I think that um, it, it's made our life a lot, lot better. Uh, so if you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Jesse Harlan. Uh, I've been running OKCJS uh, along with uh, Vance and Amanda for some time. I really like writing JavaScript. I do it a lot. Um, I did end my 85 day streak at JSConf, so it taught me how to be more human. Um, I like writing more music, and I, I, I love Amanda. I don't just like Amanda. She's really fantastic. Um, so you're probably wondering what I mean by unbraiding JavaScript. Um, and really, this is a talk about code complexity. Uh, and so I'm taking this term from Rich Hickey. I didn't come up with this. Um, but we use the word simple in, the, in this more precise way than what you're probably used to. Uh, simple means it comes from the word simplex, as in one fold, one braid, and that contrasts with the word complex, right? And I think that's, um, and you know, he points this out in a, in a talk he gave at RailsConf. Um, so I think this is cool because this is kind of a more objective, more measurable way to talk and think about simplicity in code. And um, I really believe that simplicity is what we strive to achieve, and complexity is something that it causes us problems and it causes us technical debt. What I don't mean by simple is like easy, like like convenient, like oh, you just npm install this thing and you have you have the whole thing, right? Or um, you know, something you're familiar with, right? Or like this is idiomatic. You've seen this a hundred times. Um, I'm trying to decouple those two definitions so that way we can have a more meaningful discussion, right? Um, there are things that even um, in this talk I feel like I don't do enough, but it is objectively speaking a more simple solution. So I'm trying to re reform my own thinking. So this is sort of like advice from the trenches. Like this is something that we do at our shop. Um, even before I arrived at the shop, they decided to take TDD, BDD, paired programming, all that kind of stuff very seriously. And um, even when I did arrive, I mean, we just sort of like took that and just sort of extended it and started asking our questions. What really makes our code hard to change? What really makes it hard to maintain? Like where, where does technical debt come? Like when we're looking at our files, what are the ones that are most likely to explode? With features, and uh, what are the ones that are more likely to be abstract enough that they're kind of like more reusable? And this is sort of some of the stuff that we did. Um, so we've we've seen some stuff, um, and uh, what we've learned is like complexity is kind of it's kind of this recurring theme, it's this kind of enemy. Um, and I feel like most of our serious problems, the problems that like really affect us in a negative way are traceable to complexity. These are not problems like, oh, how does Angular do this thing? Or, man, I really need to get more performance out of this particular loop. Or, um, oh my gosh, you know, why is our coverage at 75% instead of 100%? I think these are, um, these are not the thing that really cause technical debt. Now, granted, you know, someone who comes from a more TDD background will say like, well, but these are side effects. Got, and, and that's true, I, I agree with that. That's kind of what I'm trying to say here. Um, and so we talk a lot about tooling. We talk about certain techniques, but I don't. I don't think we talk about some of these. Um, this this harder topic to approach. That's what this is about. Um, so this is what we kind of learned. Yeah, it tends to hide in plain sight. Like once you see it, you're like, how did I not see that? Um, it does lower our responsiveness to change. Like sometimes we, uh, it's like you know you have to set up this band in three minutes, and here's your tangle of cables, and you're like, great, I can't just plug everyone in really quick. Or even if I did, the act of unplugging and replugging them in is really hard. Um, it makes technical debt go up. Um, it is a sign of deeper problems. Uh, and I actually included uh, this picture right here. Do you guys remember Inspector Gadget when we were kids? Right. Um, not all of us were kids. 
and some of us were <laughs> not existent or some of us were adults. But when I was a kid, Inspector Gadget was really interesting because they would always have like this crime wave. It's a crime wave in the city. People are st stealing canaries from pet shops. And then like behind every single one of them was mad, which is just a hand and a cat. Um, but that, that is complexity and it, it makes me also mad. Um, it just seems like these root cause analysis tend to, tend to point to this abstract idea. Um, so I am not the only person who talks about this. Lots of people talk about this. Um, there are just a few sources that I think are kind of primary sources, but not the only sources. I mean, I've looked at other things. John Resick uh, writes a lot about abstraction. Uh, Rebecca Murphy writes a lot about um, things on her blog. Um, I, I can't even list them all, but at least read this. I think it's really worth your time. And you may not agree with every single thing in all of these. That's OK. It's better to have known it and disagreed with it than to have not known it, right? So I'm arguing for research. So um, it's hard to divide up a talk like this. So I've got this kind of like theme, like we're going to seek and destroy. All right, well, this is about seek. This is like, what do we want it to look like? What are we kind of looking for before we discuss techniques on how to mitigate uh, code complexity? So first is ideal, like what, what is even simple code? Like I have to have some general definition as to what it is. And so a lot of text here. I'll go through it. This is a composite of a lot of ideas, not all my ideas, actually. Um, some of them come from you know, Bob Martin, some come from Rich Hickey, some come from other people. Um, but you know, I noticed that you know, good, simple code is typically loosely coupled. right? And, and I will discuss all these terms. You're probably like, what do these mean? Don't worry about it. Loosely coupled uh, implies that they, they can kind of work independently. We'll talk more about that. They have high cohesion. They, they belong. Code that is packaged together is meant, is meant to be together. Um, like my files are too big, right? There's kind of low, uh, S-lock means source lines of code, right? There's not any errors. By errors, I mean um, estimated errors that like a Halstead analysis would give you. I also mean like linting errors. I mean that the thing that I expect it to do, it does. Um, it's easy to maintain. Like if I go in there, I just change this one file and I don't touch all the others and the expected results are, are there. And then I feel like this goat that is apparently in tune with its surroundings and the environment, it's, it's really nice. Um, so these are sort of, this is sort of the set of things that I feel like is, is a sign of simplicity. Um, I'm only going to talk about these two right here because I think that these are, these don't just apply to JavaScript. These apply to everything. And um, this is like a whole talk in and of itself. So I cannot possibly do this justice in and of itself. Um, but when I say coupling, I'm referring to sort of like loose versus tight, right? Um, tight coupling means things are like welded together. You can't use them without another. So like if I have, um, I guess, a screwdriver and you know the bit in the shaft are attached, the thing that allows me to manipulate it is attached to the actual Phillips head. Whereas if I had like a Makita one where I could like switch out the bit, the, the bit and the shaft are more loosely coupled, right? Because I can swap them out independently. Um, however, cohesion is this other thing uh, which is the degree to which elements of a module belong together. And these are not, um, well, we give these analogies with Legos. I think the big point of this is that there's some nuance here, right? Um, how many of you liked puzzles growing up? <coughs> okay, how many of you liked Legos? Yeah, way more hands, because puzzles suck. <laughs> Sorry, puzzle people. Puzzles are like, would you like some work? Here's some work. <laughs> you may have it. Um, all the pieces, uh, they're, they're tightly coupled to just this one thing, and they can only be assembled one direction. Whereas Legos are, they have interdependent parts, and I can take Legos from this thing, and I can move them to this other thing. They're loosely coupled. Um, and I can even have like these different boxes of Legos, and the, this is kind of cohesive, right? Like This is a race car. But I can take these pieces apart. I can untangle them very easily. I could like have like a race car helicopter or something like that. Now you're probably noticing uh, something I notice is, oh well, does that mean that the more loosely coupled something is, the more that uh, cohesion um, it loses cohesion, right? Like if I just took all the Legos for this thing and this thing and this thing, and I just dumped them on a table, you would say that is very loosely coupled. Everything is truly as loose as it can be, and there is also no cohesion because there's just, well. Depends. Depends what you're looking at. Each individual Lego is highly cohesive. The Lego is doing its job of being a Lego, so systematically maybe it not. Um, so that's what I'm trying to say here, is there aren't actually simple answers. These are just descriptions. It's like, um, is that trash can big? Well, not compared to Jupiter, but it's a lot bigger than a quark, right? These are, these are descriptions, right? Um, but we want to maximize 
loose coupling and high cohesion, right? Um, so depending on the level you're at, I think that you have to kind of qualify the type of cohesion and the type of coupling you're about to, about to discuss. So these are not like rules, these are guidelines. These are ways to like facilitate discussions about, about complexity. Um, and so there's, you don't have to read through every single one of these. I'm just, this is just to point out that people who are smarter than me have come up with all these categorically different types of coupling. Um, you know, like things that share the same global data are essentially coupled in a way because they got to read the same thing. And, and we can kind of rate these from like not so great to awesome. And I know it's not here, but maybe down here at the bottom you'd have like no coupling. Like they don't interact whatsoever. They completely don't touch. So just kind of, there's a bunch of them. There's a continuum. Read more about them later. Same thing with cohesion, right? Um, and at the top, if I were to extend this graph, there'd be like no cohesion. Like these two things have no reason to be together. So like typically we want to try to move towards functional cohesion um, as opposed to like, you know, well these go together because they, they do similar things. Like I put all my controllers in one folder. Um, but on the other hand, if I put everything related to a feature in my application together, maybe they're grouped because they do a single task, like help you log into a website. Right, so that would be arguably more desirable, at least to other people. But I, I found in my in my world they tend to be more desirable. So that's like simple code, right? That's how we can talk about that. So what does not simple code tend to look like? Well, we we have this word called smell, which means like independent of like measuring it in some way, these are signs that things could blow up and things could go wrong. Um, so I will talk about these rigidity. Like if you go in there and it's really hard to change or like you make a change and it sort of like cascades everywhere, that's that's not a good sign, right? Or um, you change something at, a, at one point of entry and it breaks everything. Oh, um, my square calculator with length and width, I now change to length, height, and width, and then every single square calculation is now broken because you know it's, it's doing something else. That's fragile. Um, immobile, you can't, um, you can't really reuse it. You can't pull it out, like I want to use this code, pull it, drop it, put it here, you can't do that. You're running with cinder blocks on your feet. Um, viscosity of environment, not my term, but um, what that means is like the environment and the world that you're living in, that you're working in, makes it hard for you to do things like test and like rearrange things, so you just sort of don't do it. Um, I would argue that the loading time of Visual Studio might reduce its viscosity of environment compared to, but maybe, maybe the learning time of M. I, I, there's a lot of things I could go into this and you could take a lot of different ways. Repetition means um, you're literally repeating yourself, right? Like control C, control V. You should disable those. Um, and then non-opacity means that um, when you look at it, it's not obvious what it's doing. Um, like you've you've written this little piece of code poetry that's obfuscated already, and that's that's not good because no one can understand what you've done. You can't understand what you've done a week from then. Um, this is some more things that you may have not seen as much unnecessary order. So um, any time, so when we're talking about simplicity, we mean single task, single braided, right? Um, when you rely on order, like you have an ordered list versus an unordered list, that is by definition a more complex thing, right? If you have a sequence of arguments that go into a function, that is, you know, they rely on a certain order as opposed to like a map where it doesn't rely on any particular order, right? Um, something that requires order is technically more complex and that's, that's an important metric, we're gonna use that. Um, overly concrete. So this is uh, something that depends on abstractions rather than concretions. It's something that comes from object-oriented world. You know, we're typically talking about dependency inversion. There isn't a direct analog in JavaScript. This is a JavaScript talk. Um, we don't have specifically a thing called an interface. We have duct typing. But I mean this in the more general sense. You know, if I want to plug something into the wall, I don't like reach inside the wall and like pull the cables out and start soldering things to it, right? I've got this kind of thing in between me and the wall called the plug. It's a pretty nice abstraction. And, Maybe I don't have a ground, or maybe it does or does not like switch on this, but it doesn't matter. I've got this kind of nice way of, of handling it. Um, that, that is an abstraction by its very nature. And of course, this exists in all software, right? D depending on whether or not you have things like, um, you know, dependency injection and version of control and stuff like that. Um, the idea of things being abstract or more concrete, that's everywhere. And then finally, uh, poor boundaries. Um, something that's really well defined, has a really obvious job is obviously going to be more simple because um, it's less likely to be a target for feature creep and it's less likely to, to blow up. Um, so I think that's, you know, it's S-lock is gonna stay low, you know, these sorts of things, measurable things. And this is the one that I think is the most important, um, viscosity of design. 
If you cut corners to get it done right now, you will pay for it. It is so easy to make work for yourself. It is so easy. Um, this is a, don't throw a code mattress in your code swimming pool, right? You want to make work for somebody, it takes about 10 minutes of your time. It's going to take weeks of their time. Just put a mattress in their swimming pool, right? It like kind of gets waterlogged and they can't really saw it apart because of the springs. It just totally sucks and it's like super heavy and like not hard for you to make a lot of work for someone. Or you could just buy them a, a puzzle for their birthday. That's also another, <laughs> another thing you can do, right? Like um, it's actually really easy to, you know, you're just like, oh, I'll just weld these things together and then I can pass this one thing around. It's really easy. I love it, right? Well, maybe. What if you need to delete one of those things? Um, it's tempting to make a Swiss Army knife. It's tempting to do it out of convenience. It's tempting to do it because it's easier at that exact moment. But you will pay for it in the long run, uh, even if the, <clears throat> you'll pay for it in terms of technical debt. So um, this, and finally, this is my opinion about simple code. Um, I think, I really believe that like everything you write is like a little meme, right? Like it's trying to survive. And a survivable piece of code is something that gets reused. Like a highly survivable piece of code is the Lodash library, right? Like everyone depends on it. It's very abstract, it's very nice, it doesn't care about your specific domain. It's well written, it's tested, it's survivable, right? What's not survivable is that inline style that you threw in your HTML. It can only be used in one place. There's no way to describe it other than the properties that are inside of it. It's the exact opposite of survivable. So when you are looking at every line of code, you're always thinking, can I make this survive more or should I just delete it? Does it not belong here? Is there something else that's more survivable that already does its job? So that is, you just frame that. When we're talking about this, that is my opinion as to what simple code is. That is my opinion as to what smells are. And not just my opinion, a lot of people feel this way, right? But I want to qualify my opinion before I start discussing about how are we going to seek and destroy? Um, we're going to destroy complexity. Uh, so I think um, you should use a modern build system in JavaScript. I think that is probably, uh, by the way, I put the more important stuff and less controversial stuff at the front. Um, because it is probably the best thing that has happened in terms of being able to ensure loose coupling and high cohesion to the entire JavaScript world. If you're not using a modern build system, you are increasing the complexity of your stack, even at the expense of having to learn the build system, right? I mean, at the very least, if you're concatenating files like automatically, you don't have to like include them in a specific order inside of your HTML file, which that's complexity, right? If you move this, if you've jQuery UI above jQuery, the whole thing breaks. It's more complicated. Um, it's better to use require.js, but then you have to go in there and you have to like wrap everything in a function. You have to say, I am called this and I require this. And that, that's a little bit more work. Um, the very best thing you can do, in my opinion, it's my opinion, uh, is use like common JS modules. Use like a, something like Webpack or Browserify, where it builds the dependency graph for you. And it's, for the most part, transparent. And then you use a task runner to kick it off, and then you can also do other things with your task runner, like lint and do analysis and things like that. That completely decouples your build environment from your runtime environment. Like they are not, they don't care about each other anymore, and that's good. That, that imp Im increases simplicity in the long run. It should only require one step. Um, you should be able to arrange your files unrestricted by load order. Um, this enforces uh, convention. And uh, this is uh, this is a big deal because you know we are we're putting these things in a browser and there's these sort of like constraints put in like things have to load in a certain order. This pretty much untangles that knot for you, and that is a big deal. Like when you have to keep up with that sort of thing, if you need to like swap out one library for another, how much work are you personally doing to, to get past that? This is the next one, and this is a big this is a big one. So it's got subslides. Uh, use com complexity analysis tooling. Turns out a lot of smart people, um, smarter than me have figured out ways to, at least as best they can, objectively measure complexity. By the way, by the way, I'm just going to pause. If I'm like going too fast or you see something, you don't know what it is, just please speak up. Like I know that we're just burning through this stuff and it's like brain jump, so I get it. Um, so actually really like this quote. This is an actual Plato quote and I think it's appropriate considering uh, you know, some of this stuff does take a little foresight, like you have to take the time to set this stuff up, it will, it will pay for itself. Um, so you want to easily see what files are the biggest. You want to, he came up with something called a maintainability index. I'll show you how it's calculated. He can estimate what he believes the number of bugs are going to be in delivery. Uh, and then this idea of cyclomatic complexity. 
so S lock is source lines of code. More is bad. What can I say? You got a 5,000 line file. No one wants to touch it. It's probably not all one single concern. Maybe it's highly cohesive, but it's probably not loosely coupled, right? I mean, it, it's complex. It's a complex thing. People get afraid of opening files at large. That's a lot to hoist in your mind every time you open up a single component. And then if you want to reuse any of it, really, at the end of the day, you're going to have to pull things out and put it somewhere else. You can't just reuse the whole thing. Um, estimated errors. Um, math. <laughs> don't wake out about this. More is bad. You don't want more estimated errors. I, this could be like a whole talk in and of itself. Just you don't want more of them. Um, this one I think is worth talking about a little bit more. Cyclometric complexity is basically, the, it's the number of linear, li linearly independent paths. It's not a bad way to think of it as how many times you branch. That's not crazy. You know, that's, there, there's, there's a way to, it's not just you just start counting. There's, there's kind of a formula to it. Um, but here's like a real world example for real people. Um, that has a complexity of one, <laughs> right? There's no if statements, there's a function, there's one point of entry, right? One. This one has one if and then another if. And so that has a complexity of three. Because that's, you know, there's a point of entry, and then there's one branch, there's another branch. So E minus N plus P. Um, I do not expect you to look at every function and calculate this. That's why we use tools. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I've got a little complexity meter for you that this is a general guideline and highly opinionated. Um, you've probably seen this on some bumper stickers around here. No branches, no problems, no branches, <laughs> no problems. Uh, so the highly unscientific and anecdotal complexity meter. Um, I start wigging out around here-ish. Actually, I really start wigging out around here. You don't want complexity over like 10. You don't want like these big switch statements. You don't want, you have to test all that, right? Like you have to like account for every single thing that your code can do. Um, that's, that's the design. So just don't, don't let this number creep up. Maybe it's time to start untangling those things and pulling them apart and putting them in other places. And uh, so that way you can think of them independently and they do single, single jobs. Uh, and then finally, you put it all together and you get a maintainability index. Um, this is going to be different depending on the language. Um, low is bad, high is good. In this case, it's uh, being um, kind of normalized from zero to 100. Um, if you're wondering where you sit with the best of the best, jQuery is 78. It didn't used to be that high. They actually went through a massive refactoring and made it nice. It was in the 60s before. Uh, Marionette, this is probably one of the best maintained code bases, uh, 74.19. If you're above 70, you're killing it. Good job. Uh, so don't. Did you measure gold? Huh? Did you measure gold? No, I didn't measure Gulp. I'm sorry about that. We could go look. Um, Gulp, is, Gulp is a really well composed library. Uh, so yeah, what does it actually what does it actually end up looking like? We're just going to look at Marionette.js because why not? You look at anything. This is what Plato spits out. It's pretty cool. Every single time that you run Plato, it adds more points to this graph. My advice is to put Plato in your whatever cycle you're doing, like a TDD cycle, whatever. Like every single time you build. You look at this graph and you're like, is what I'm doing making this graph go up? Is what I'm doing making this graph go down? I can tell you that with source lines of code, ideal is something that kind of looks like a like a logarithm, right? Like we have to do a whole lot at first to make our framework, and then as we add more code, we can reuse more and more of it, and it kind of flattens out. Like we're just kind of composing pieces near the end. Uh, super bad is uh, exponential, and like eh, linear. Every time you add a feature, you add more code, you're probably not reusing enough, right? But you can kind of see it, right? You actually have some kind of actual visual. Um, this is pretty cool. So check this out. One thing that Plato does is it actually breaks it down per file, and it shows you what the maintainability is per file. And then you can actually click on these guys, and you can go into the file and look at this file and see how many lines of code it has, how many errors it has. And wait, there's more. By the way, I love Plato. I think it is bomb digging. Um, here's every single function. Gee, I sure wish I knew what that function was. <laughs> I'll get to that. <laughs> I know what that one is. That's normalize UI string because it has a name and it was worth writing. I'm sorry, I have a very strong opinion about that. It is an opinion, but it is very strong. Um, you can come down here and you can actually hover over these guys and it will tell you what the complexity of this function is, what the length is, what the estimated difficulty and bugs are based upon those kind of equations we had before. So, you know, um, 
it is worth your time to, it, it, there is there's no hard numbers I can give you. If you work on your code and you kind of look at this over time, and you sort of, it sort of teaches you patterns. It, much like TDD drives the way that you work, like, you know, when you have to break things out into tests, you end up kind of like doing them in more isolated ways. I really believe this complexity analysis is gonna make you write things differently than you normally would have written them. You, you're like, oh, maybe I should like unweld this thing. And, oh, wow, look, it doesn't branch as much and my complexity changed. And I think it's gonna, um, it will help you. It helped our shop a lot. It did the right thing. Um, this, this is a regular part of our, of our cadence. It's worth it. So Play-Doh, it's the bomb, it's the best tool we got. Works on top of a thing called Esprima, it's pretty tight. Um, I didn't talk about linting, uh, Play-Doh does lint. So um, you should lint your code every day. It's kind of a hygiene thing. Um, we are not in a strongly typed compiled environment, right? It's all runtime. So we use another tool to go look at it and make sure that it's enforcing stylistic consistency. Um, yeah, uh, it is, linting is when you run something on top of your code and it goes and looks at it and it's like, ah, yeah, you forgot a semicolon. Oh, no, you should probably put a comma over there. It's like, did you mean camel case? You made a mistake. It is the it is the derp detector. Um, so ideally, you have no, no zero linked errors. Like all your stuff is well formed, right? It's like uh, it's like your punctuation checker in Microsoft Word. Um, add it to your build pipeline. Run it every single time. Whatever you're doing, if, if you're writing just for yourself, then obviously determine what you're going to do stylistically. There's a Google style guide that's a perfectly reasonable starting point. We determine it democratically as a shop. We're like, we want to use this many spaces, we want to do this, we want to. You can also um, mention high cyclomatic complexity and stuff like that inside of your uh, uh, JSN uh, RC file. Um, and then never, ever, ever, ever turn it off, ever. Like, just leave it on. There's no reason to not hint your code unless you are having self-esteem problems. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, and then there's a little, there's an online thing you can run and you can just kind of look at it, right? So like, I can see I've got a main function and it's like, I only have one statement. If I come in here and like, I delete the semicolon, it's like you're missing a semicolon, which if I have decided that's the thing I care about, then I can set those rules, right? If you've seen this before, bear with me, it's worth pointing out. <clears throat> right, it's like I'm writing all kinds of terrible stuff. You get the idea. Go play with this, it's fun. Factor when s lock gets too high. Uh, so you're looking for these big spikes. These are like, obviously, signs. You, this, this is complexity that needs to be destroyed. So like, when is s lock too high? <laughs> uh, well, that depends on your situation and the type of file and whether it's a built file or not, right? Like, obviously, built file is really big. Uh, but in my experience, if you really had to put me down on a number, I would say, mm, it's about 350. <laughs> and less than 150 is ideal. Like, you don't, you don't want things getting into the thousands, clearly, right? But it's a matter of degree. It's like, how sick is sick? You know, like, obviously something with zero lines is non-code, right? Uh, so, anyway, uh, this is how I feel when I'm using Play-Doh and finding things with giant uh, spikes. Um, we have, uh, you know, confession, uh, and we're not alone. We found things in our shop, or we found things where we were implementing um, probably not the best pattern. The file was cohesive, but it had like 2,000 lines in it. And it was essentially kind of a, like a large plugin that all the configuration had ended up in the, in the file, right? Um, and it's something that, um, you know, a few folks had worked on it, and they had not intended it to be this way. Like, I mean this uh, completely sincerely. It was a complete accident that this file had blown up. But the important thing is you can see S-lock over time. Like you can see like, oh, as features are coming into an application, they're kind of collecting over here, right? That's the reason why this is important. And this file is getting really complex. Maybe this file should be broken apart. Maybe this file shouldn't even be in this project and it should be a totally other module. And that's kind of what we learned. That was the thing we learned. Uh, next time around, we've, we've made this kind of file, a totally separate sort of module. We serve it uh, to everything that way and it, it's totally great. Uh, so yeah, man, do that. Uh, keep your changes local, loses coupling, it makes you think about cohesion differently. It's just a, it's a good thing. Keep your module small. Um, I'm getting increasingly controversial. Um, a lot of people use frameworks and libraries that do not exploit global logics. Some of them do. Um, I know that can't be avoided. Angular has a global object, right? So does jQuery. Like lots of them do. That's just sort of the way, the way of the world. Um, but objectively speaking. The less that they require that, the better, right? So 
Sometimes you will accept a certain amount of complexity to achieve your goals, but you have to think of it that way. No. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you are using like Lodash and you're doing it without the global module, like you're requiring you know, Lodash every single time that you need it, um, versus something that is always looking at the global namespace, I can go look at every single file that's requiring or injecting some particular thing, right? If it's in the global namespace, anyone can grab it anytime. I have no idea who's been in it. It's like a public pool with no key card access or something. Like I have no idea who's swimming in it. Um, and that also means that things can get braided together and you don't know. Um, and that's just the way that it is. And sometimes we say, well, we're doing DOM manipulation and this is inside of the browser and these ideas go together, so the dollar sign reigns supreme from above, whatever, you know, but it is still preferable to not have the global namespace. Um, yeah, so uh, I was working on Phaser.js. I've been working on a, uh, a build system for it for a long time. And uh, it requires uh, three global namespaces. It requires uh, P2, Pixie, and Phaser, Phaser itself. Um, when I tried to convert that to common JS modules, it was like the hardest thing in the world to actually pull this stuff apart because you couldn't. I had to write a shim. I can't change their code. It's their code out on their repo. You know, it, most of what I can do is. Yeah, we've got it. Almost got it there. And, uh, it's okay. So everything's great. Yeah. Everything's great. Yeah. Pay attention to me. I'm looking out the window. Should be doing that. Never do that when you're speaking. Don't do the thing that I just did. <laughs> Squirrel. Um, uh, no, but like, I mean, this was one of those times where I was just like, I see it. I understand. This thing expects this to be loaded in this particular order. I can't depend on these independently. I can't build this a certain way. They're going to move away from this in version 3.0, but um, yeah, like you don't notice it until you have to go back and then rebuild something or take something out. That's when you notice how intertwined they are. Um, Phaser's global namespace is super complex. I love Phaser. I give a presentation on it, but that's the truth. And if I want to use it, I have to sort of accept that as sort of part of my life. Here we are. Not everyone agrees with this. I think you should name every single function. I think that a function without a name is almost not worth writing. It's not my opinion, actually. I, I actually didn't believe this um, two or three years ago at all. If I had him, he likes anonymous functions. Um, <laughs> anonymous functions omit a name, which has helped in providing a more read on external code. Da, 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 da. He's given these reasons. Um, so yeah, this is a strong opinion, right? Um, and I did not do this like at all, but we we gave it a shot. Like, let's try this. Let's see what it do. Um, we will never, ever, ever go back. These are his reasons. You can read them whenever you want. Um, it helps with recursion. Um, it's nice for stack traces. Someone would say, oh yeah, we'll Chrome fix that. Well, okay. Um, you know, readable, understandable code. Uh, maybe that's subjective. Um, I'm going to add a few things that I've noticed just by doing this for a year. Um, it is your first line of defense and not what God balance is greater than some arbitrary number. Well, the next time you go to do that, if you just threw this inline thing over here, you don't remember that you've done this. You don't have any way of like searching your code base or, or doing an analysis. I mean, putting something anonymously online, like if I came to you and said, hey, dude, it's awesome. I, uh, I just threw some styles in line in all of my HTML, and uh, they're just used right there locally, right there on the HTML, and uh, I didn't need to clutter it up with all those class names we would be like, you're crazy, right? You've essentially created a thing that can only be used in one spot. And if you're reusing those properties somewhere else, you don't know. Like, are you gonna go through and actually break that apart and audit it and be like, well, the border's red because it's an error and the text is big because it's important. You're not gonna do these things. So I believe the same logic is perfectly applicable to naming your functions. Um, and it's also gonna make it more, uh, it's gonna promote better opacity, which I told you, I believe is a smell, is low opacity. Um, if you have to read the contents of it to know what it is, that's a problem. This is why we should always put a TPS report on every single memo that goes out. That would be really nice if you guys would do that. <laughs> uh, uh, but more importantly, I, I think nothing is more concrete than a nameless one-off function. Like nothing, the way that you identify it is by the properties it has. The way that you identify a style on your HTML is by the properties that it has, right? That, that is its thing, right? The way that you identify a function is by what it does, and it should be named after what it does. What it does. Otherwise, you've got to go look inside. Um, so imagine that you're in a classroom, and you have all these students, and you have name tags, but you elect to not use the name tags, and you said, I don't know what any of your names are, but I'm going to put you in boxes. 
var my student name equals anonymous function. And you don't refer to the students, you refer to the boxes. And you don't even know which student's in the box until you call on them at runtime. But then you also have these other boxes that are like timeout and like student of the month. And um, the principal comes along and is like, dude, you had name tags, like why, or do that, whatever. You had name tags, why didn't you use them? Did you measurably like simplify your job, right? If I say var in timeout equals Jane Doe function, right? As opposed to like who's in timeout, I don't know. Like there's, you, you're going to run into problems with your abstraction if you don't fully utilize the fact that you can name your functions. You may not be seeing it, you may not be seeing it, and that's fine, that's fine. You know, that's a cool thought experiment, cool story. So what is this, tell me what this code does. Adam, what does this code do? Well, it looks like it's taking a list of customers and it's sorting it by their balance. And it looks like I'm making a date and I'm adding two weeks. And then I'm going to make this thing down here. Please remit your balance by this date. This is not complicated. It's simple code. But now we know what it does. Now, someone up here, Jordan, what does this code do? You can just read it like a sentence, right? Yeah, change customers, filters, by the balance, sorts by the balance. Apps. Yeah. What about the next time you need to filter customers with a high balance? You've already written that function. <laughs> what about this guy or girl? <laughs> They'd have to go remember. But what if it's two different people? This is the stuff we came across. Real life code situation. This is not that far off from how we do transformations for data at our, at our shop. It's what we learned the hard way. What happens when you need to do it again? Uh, what happens when you come across another situation that also has balance and you need to do a similar operation? You can like duct type them. Like, what if this code was actually really complicated, not just a simple mapping and filtering? Like it was like, like crazy stuff's happening on the inside of there. How do I encapsulate it? How do I abstract it? Uh, so you don't have to do this, but I'm telling you, naming our functions has significantly improved our code base. I'm telling you because it, wor it did work for us. And I know, um, and I really believe that based upon the, if you if you agree with my definition of simple, it is also simple. And so I'm kind of, I know I'm being evangelical about this, but Virtually every code base you find is var name equals anonymous function. And I think that you pay for it in the long run. Uh, so that's my, my sincere. So, um, and I'm just gonna say, uh, when you do this, we are preferring revealing modules to just sort of standard modules where you attach them and there's these big sort of code accordions and you have to sort of read the whole file to even know how many public accessors there are. And it makes things easily extracted because if I, if I wanna take this public method and pull it out and then depend on it over here, it's already named, it's already pulled apart. I don't need to scroll halfway down the file. It's pretty obvious what's going on. So that is, um, that is truthy. It's somewhere between fact and opinion. I, everything I said is true, but I can see someone certainly disagreeing with it. But I think you should name your functions. Hopefully I've made a good case for that. Um, avoid long function argument lists in favor of mapped data structures. And furthermore, avoid overloading your functions in JavaScript. It's not like other languages where you're going to have like a whole bunch of ways to draw a rect. Like you, you're not going to do like type checking in the same way. Uh, inside of these things. Um, remember, one of the definitions of complexity is that the things that are ordered are by definition more complex than a map, right? Um, you can introduce brittleness. Uh, imagine that you have something that calculates area and its length and width and it's like on two dimensional objects and then you decide to go add height and height is for some reason the second parameter. Every single point of entry of that function is now broken. But if you had passed it an object with a map, that's not the case. You can just check for the existence of that property inside of the, inside of the function that has been sprinkled throughout your code. Um, no, maps are awesome. Use them like crazy. And what is in our language? A map is an object, key value pair. That is what that means. Um, how many params is too many? They say too many params will spoil the broth. I get antsy around five. After that, I'm like, mm, not so great. Um, and I didn't include it in here, but it's actually uh, when I talk about overloading functions, um, I have some code. It is an error handler for Express middleware. Yes. Yes. Right. So you talked about the object, right? You're doing your checking of the object in your function, right? Correct. But for JavaScript, you don't have a way to check that unless you're basically like ifing every single property on there. So that's just increasing the complexity of that function. But where are you ifing that in one spot? You're doing it for like every single property, so that's like a separate check, right? Maybe you're not doing it for every property. Maybe. Maybe there's one branch. If there's an existence of height, you do it like a three-dimensional object, and if there's no existence of height, you do it like, you, you're right, you're going to introduce complexity either way, right, when you change that function. The question is, 
am I going to do it through overloading where now that undefined property has actually broken all the code or can I handle it in one place in my code in this case? It's like a, you know, where, where do you want the breaks to occur? Do you want them to occur the same, same place everywhere? I mean, I get what you're saying. You're saying like, oh, I could see a situation where this one function increases in complexity, but, but there's ways to handle that too. Imagine that that branch then calls separate functions, one for calculating 2D, one for calculating 3D. Right now, you have your calculate area. Before, you would have had to go to every single situation in your code and be like, all right, is this a 2D or 3D object? Okay, let's swap out this function. Okay, is this a 2D or 3D? Imagine that there's 10,000 uses of this particular function. You can solve it in about five minutes in one spot, or you can solve it over the course of weeks everywhere. Does that make sense? So you're right, you're right. It does introduce complexity, it does. The cyclomatic complexity is gonna go up. And then you're probably gonna have to do other things to mitigate it, but at least you're doing it in one place as opposed to everywhere. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying put an object into every single function you've ever done, ever. Like, that's not what I'm saying. This is a matter of degree. This is like when you're building a building and you're like, oh, that's getting kind of tall. Like, or, you know, that sort of thing. Or maybe, maybe we should reinforce this a little bit more. None of these are truly hard and fast rules, except for naming your functions. You should name every function. <laughs> um, I get dancing around five. That is not, it depends on the situation. Like, it really does. Um, I will say that with function overloading, and I, unfortunately this got deleted from my slides, but um, if you have a piece of middleware in Node, right, and it's like an error handling piece of middleware, and by the way, thank you, Milo, for speaking up. I know a lot of you guys are listening, but please just ask if you have a question. Um, if you do request, response, and next, right, that's three arguments, right? If you do error, request, response, and next, that's a different signature, right? So if you make a piece of error handling middleware and you forget next on the end, like you're not even using it, guess what? It's gonna break. And it's not gonna tell you why. Because all those objects will exist and it won't make sense. You will be console.logging your request. You will you essentially introduce a branch condition in the function declaration. Every single time that function is declared, the function itself is a branch condition. So if you can avoid that, if you can make them separate functions or something like that, now sometimes it's not always an option. We're trying to think of like, what are ways where this objectively can get more complex? Uh, it is objectively more complex if I have to change something in a thousand places versus in one place, right? Uh, it is objectively more complex if a function is not by its declaration a branch, right? That's the kind of thing we're talking about. We can't always do that. And in the situation with Node, the reason they're like that is because um, they conventionally always pass errors in the first time. It's sort of like a Node thing. So they're like, well, sometimes you want an error and sometimes you don't, so they overloaded the function. So sometimes you have to deal with these trade-offs there is no panacea. There are no simple answers. I think that was in a slide earlier, and I, I believe that. Um, this is not my opinion. This is Rich Hickey's opinion, um, but I actually agree with him. I think he's right. In my in my estimation, this tends to be tends to be more true. Um, so when I say functional data manipulation, I mean um, rather than storing state in options in in, in objects. Uh, you have data and you have functions, right? And we already do this. Like if you're separating, if you have POCO objects and services, you're probably doing something like this. Or if you have JSON and then things that can manipulate JSON, you're, you're already doing this. Um, this is kind of a response to, uh, there was a, have you ever heard of the anemic data model where they were saying, oh, you don't want to do that. Like everything needs to be in one spot. The car needs to own the fact that it drives. And then we kind of like realize, well, yeah, but I can have drive as a separate function and pass a car in. It's this total different way of, of doing it. Um, and we have really good functional ways of manipulating data. And Lodash is basically one of the best ones out there. 90% um, of what you want to do, you're probably going to do in map, filter, reduce, and I guess reject, but that's really just filter. Like, um, that, these are, this is the bread and butter of, of functional data manipulation. Um, we found that by doing things that way, we wrote a lot less imperative loops, things were easier to debug. That thing that I showed you earlier with the chain, that was that. Like the, the easy one to read, right? So that's ideal. Also, don't reach for each. This is, we say this a lot. Um, <laughs> nine times out of 10, don't get me wrong, there are times when you should use read, each. Like if you're doing some incidental task over an iterator. But nine times out of 10, the reason you're iterating over something is you, you're trying to build some other collection or you're trying to mutate the data. Use map, map is the right tool for the job. Um, if you use each, you're going to do this. I've already, I've seen it. I've seen it a hundred times. Var my array equals an empty array, and then for each one of these objects, I'm gonna push something into that array, mm -hmm. and then I'm gonna transform it every single time I'm done, that I can access my array that's outside of the functional scope. 
or you could just use math. That's its job. So you, you introduced a lot of complexity. You had to declare more variables. You had to do more work. It kind of leapt out of the function into a global namespace. It's objectively more complicated than using the right function for the right job. Um, favor objects in unordered lists over primitives. Um, if you are trying to hydrate a grid and you give it a 2D array of numbers versus a list of objects and then like a column model that kind of orthogonally puts them in the right way, this one is more robust. You can click a button and sort it, right? This one you have to mutate the underlying data structure um, and it relies on order, right? So it's more complicated. Um, this is one that will, if you write a lot, you'll see what I'm talking about. But generally speaking, you, someone might say, oh, a list of strings is simpler than a list of objects, right? Yeah, until you need to extend that list, until you need to add another property to it, until you need last name and first name, then you're, then you're in a bind. The, um, and here's another one, uh, objects are not lists, arrays are. This is another one that I see a lot, and it uh, creates a lot of complexity, and I unfortunately, the code got deleted from this. I did, by the way, if you're on slides and you modify one slide and then you close it and then you go modify one that's been open, it's going to persist that one state. So, that, so don't don't do that. <laughs> Heads up. <laughs> um, you lists are meant to be lists. Um, you know they're they're meant to be sortable. Uh, they're meant to be. You can filter them. You can you manipulate them functionally. Um, if you want to get the length of the list, you just call dot length. Right. That's what that's for. When I say list, I mean I mean arrays. Um, with an object, you have to go look at every single property and count them. Objects are for objects and tree-like structures. And if you conflate the two, you'll find that you're introducing a lot of complexity really, really fast. Um, we, we, um, we came across this recently in our own code base. Uh, there was something that was a list of things, and it got converted to an object, because people were like, oh, it's like a dictionary, it's like a map, it's like a list of key-value pairs. And a list got turned into a tree, and then every single time we wanted to iterate over the list, just every single time you wanted to do something to a list, got more complicated, more complicated, more complicated, and it cascaded down the entire stack. And so now we gotta go back and change a fundamental data structure. So you gotta pick the right thing for the right job. Um, and this is, this is one that, uh, depending on, now when I say easy, you might be really familiar with vertical object-oriented inheritance, and it's not wrong. And there are some domains that it makes more sense in, like if you're doing game programming, that's just kind of how it is. Um, but um, if you can composite things, like with a mix-in pattern or something like that, uh, you will find that it is a much, much simpler mechanism for inheritance. Um, I'm talking about when you go into React and you can build mix-ins that basically do the same job that interfaces or something would do in C-sharp. And, and they can be, they're more abstract because they're partial implementations, each one of them. And you don't get the brittle base class problem where, you know, if you want a banana, you have to have a monkey in a jungle holding a banana. You can literally just have a banana, and that's its only job, but it's single purpose. And you can sort of divide your code up more easily. And I am not the only person that thinks, like, you will find that composition over inheritance is a recurring theme in other languages. This is something that a lot of folks have learned. So the way to do that in JavaScript is to use things like the mixing pattern and stuff like that. I mean, there might be times when you really need like referential linking and prototypes are the right thing to do. That's cool. You can do that. Just keep it shallow, right? And then for the rest of it, try to favor mixins if you can. They're a little bit less brittle. Um, this is not my uh, idea. This is Rebecca's Murphy idea. Is there is no else if, and also I would say fail fast in your functions. So if you've ever done recursive programming, you know that there's a base case at the top. Like you don't even break into the function at all if you don't uh, meet the conditions for a base case. Uh, so this is sort of in that category. This is something that I found that if we if we do something in the function and then further down we have a way to sort of like break out early, um, you don't know where things are going to be. And the other thing is, I rarely ever find myself writing else if. Like usually it's like here's all the reasons I can't go into this function and then now I'm in and I do it. Like the function is the else if. Otherwise, maybe it needs to be another function. Maybe it needs to be broken apart. This is something that will instantly reduce cyclomatic complexity by reducing else if and lots and lots of branching. Like a two-way fork is much simpler than a way to escape, right? So you'll start having these functions where like maybe there's like three sort of almost validation-like ways to break out and then you'll perform the meat and potatoes sort of down at the bottom. So try, next time you're about to write an else if, oh, and here's another thing. Uh, a lot of times you'll be like, ah, oh, well, I'm using ternary operators, so we're good, right? Well, how many times are you using terminary operators where maybe a simple short circuit operator would have been more, more effective? It's just one operation, and you're really just trying to, to like, um, have an object, uh, a value, sort of like a preset for that value, right? 
you don't necessarily need to branch as much. So um, prefer polymorphic patterns over excessive uh, control flow. Uh, this is right out of main code, and it's totally true in JavaScript. Polymorphic patterns, this could be like strategy patterns, stuff like that. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, what I'm saying is uh, imagine in your mind um, that you have like a validator, right? Like you run this validator on a form. And so you're really clever. You're like, okay, I have like email and I have address and I have all these things. So what I'll do is I'll make this big validator function and I'll put a giant switch inside of it. And if it's an email, I'll do this. And if it's a phone number, I will do this. And essentially you have a branch for every single thing that you would do. And that sucks, right? Every single time you add a new thing, the complexity is going to go up. Every single time that thing is going to branch one more time. Or over here, you have this totally other bank of functions. And depending on what kind of input it is, you can execute the correct validator function. You can swap it out at runtime. These runtime patterns reduce branching at the very beginning, and they're more effective. As you extend them, you add more of these functions. But the core thing that would have branched, it doesn't grow. It stays the same size forever. Its only job is to plug stuff in forever. As, it, as complexity increases, it, it increases in these other places. You don't touch this file anymore. That's why it's more simple. The more you can build things where things kind of plug at runtime versus a whole bunch of branching, oh, that's the right way to do it. I promise. You will, it'll, and it's hard to know when to identify this. It's not obvious all the time, right? It takes practice. Uh, but that is, if you can prefer these kind of polymorphic patterns over a lot of branching, it's going to make your life a lot easier. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, this is one that Rich Hickey pointed out. I agree with it. Um, function chains are probably preferable to nesting, but queues are even better than chains. So uh, imagine uh, a Lodash or a bunch of functions with callbacks, and they just kind of get bigger like this, or they, they kind of get nested this way. Um, the order is important of those functions. Like if you move them around, it's going to change what they do. Uh, it's very difficult to kind of go do surgery, even if you've named them all, right? Like it doesn't matter. Like even if it's just this kind of terse little, little thing. Um, or you can put them in a chain, and that kind of orthogonally separates them out. So you're doing one thing, then another thing, then another thing. And it's, it's technically doing the same thing, but it's easier for you to work with. You can like comment one out, and it doesn't change the others. Like how do you comment out the inside of this thing? Um, but what's really great, and I don't do this enough myself, is pull things into queues, where you have this one thing over here that's sort of the order in which you're going to do stuff, and you have this other thing that's all the stuff you're going to do. So from an architectural standpoint, this is objectively more simple. So what's an example in JavaScript? Um, built tasks. Like you're like, I'm going to do a built task. I'm going to do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And the tasks are defined all the way over here. So you got a queue of everything you're going to do over here, and all the tasks and things you're going to do over here. Um, middleware has more in common with this than it has with a, a direct chain. You declare these things, you can swap them around, but you can pull the middleware out into these other files, and it's a, it's a better way of doing it. The function itself lives in another place. You can declare what they do in what order over here. So that's, that's simpler. It decouples them, they're more loosely coupled. Um, and uh, that's just kind of the right way to do it. So, um, and then, <clears throat> I'm getting close to the end, by the way. Um, so, organize code by your application domain, not by pieces of technology. Remember we were talking about the different types of cohesion? Now, some are preferable to others. So, if I said, okay, here's a login. There's a controller in the controllers folder. There's a directive in the directives folder. This is this in this folder. And it's kind of spread throughout my code base. Well, the controllers folder is cohesive in that, yes, everything in here is a controller. But it's not cohesive from the point of view of your application, right? Like it's 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 more coupled to the fact that it is JavaScript and it is built of controllers. Whereas you say this this package right here, that's everything related to a login. They're they're more cohesive, but you can still have all the separate files inside of there. We started doing this when we deleted a piece of UI. We didn't even know what was in it. We just deleted the folder and it was out of the app. Nothing broke. It was awesome. Um, normally we would have to go pluck it out of the entire app. And then finally, this is the last one, try to write self-documenting code. I think this is mainly to increase opacity. That means lots and lots of comments means it probably is not obvious what your code is doing. Maybe you should name your functions. Or break things out into smaller things that are more single responsibility, right? Um, Hungarian notation is also a sign that something's wrong. If I say, this is a string name, well, it's always going to be a string. What if it becomes an object with first and last? Am I going to go throughout my entire application and change stir? No, that sucks. Um, and then um, you want to abstract your conditionals and functions if you can, and preferably you know, positive conditionals. So if I said, um, uh, if there is an entity and the entity's x condition value is greater than zero, and it's less than the screen width, and its height is greater than zero, and it's less than the screen height, then I'm going to go do something. 
or I could just say if the entity is on the screen. That's it. And then every single time I want to do that check again, guess what? I already wrote a function for. I can just pass it around. Way simpler. Otherwise, you're more you're too concrete. You're not abstract enough. So, um, and it's self-documenting too. So it all kind of all kind of works together. So there are some fallacies. I think things that you might think would increase simplicity or decrease complexity, but don't. Um, that means it's the illusion of simplicity. Like it's the skin of simplicity, but it's not actually like it doesn't do anything different. So this is usually going to be like style, um, but that sometimes they can make things worse. So uh, a primitive data structure of simple primitives is simpler than a complicated objects. Well, if you're like, I'm going to use all strings everywhere instead of objects, you're going to end up writing like 10 times more mapping functions, and nothing is going to be extensible. Like this is a fallacy. Like uh, you want to use the right object for the right job, and, and objects are, are fine in JavaScript. Um, I don't use semicolons, and I format my code a special magical way, so it's automatically simpler because there's less typing and there's more white space. Um, that's cool. It just doesn't change the complexity one way or the other. Like, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Actually, I, I don't personally use this, but lots of people do. They're great programmers. It doesn't actually change the complexity of the code. It's just a stylistic difference. It's like, I don't know, spelling called the gray with an A. It doesn't, doesn't, you know, doesn't change the branching. It doesn't change the number. Of, really doesn't meaningfully change the number of lines per file. It's not simpler. I use short variable names, so all my code is smaller and therefore more simple. <laughs> all right, you got a function. It's got one argument coming in, E. What is it? Event. Or, error, error. or, Element. or, <laughs> yeah, real simple. <laughs> not simple at all. Uh, name your variables. Uh, I, by the way, Confession, I did this a lot. I read D3 source code. I thought it was really cool. Oh, yeah, D means datum. <laughs> I changed my ways. Um, you, you will obfuscate your code. You will make it less opaque. Uh, and you also, what about a situation where you need an event and an error? Well, uh, can't use two E's. <laughs> um, I stopped using braces on my if statements. Think of the savings. It's all just so clean and pure looking. Think of all the pixels that aren't even there anymore. <laughs> This one is also, doesn't really affect it one way or the other, but actually, because that does affect branching and control flow, this could make it worse. There's lots of people who have written on this. If you need to extend what occurs inside of your if, like you need to do if some condition, two things happen. Well, you're going to either have to put the braces back in, or it may not be you, maybe some other person, right? You actually could introduce a bug and not even know, because what if that if doesn't get hit right away? What if for some reason it didn't get covered with code? Um, I actually am very forgiving on the whole semicolon thing. Put your braces on your statements. Just put them on there. You will break your code if you don't do it, eventually. And it'll be a Heisen bug. You'll, it'll work 99% of the time, but that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to be consistent. So I actually think that not doing this could make it worse, even though there's less characters. Um, I do everything shorthand. Sweet code poetry. Math.round, how about two tildes? Time to parse an in. I put a plus next to it. Uh, if you can't read my code, it's because you're real dumb. Plus a type list, double whammy. <laughs> well, if you're using two tildes for math.round, um, I suppose that there are some benchmarks out there where there's marginal performance difference. You know, and most of the code, most of the people in your team might know what it is. Um, I suppose that if you put little plus signs next to your strings instead of percent, um, at best you're not actually changing your code any. Like it's still branching the same amount. It's still doing the same thing. You're you're saving maybe five characters, which doesn't matter once you occupy the code, right? At most, you're lowering the opacity. Like that's that's about as point. But it doesn't actually improve the simplicity of the code. It is the skin of simplicity. It's like changing the color of a truck. The truck still does the same stuff. And uh, that is pretty much the the whole of my talk. This is just a collection of things that I, that I picked up over the years. Um, some of them are opinionated, but they have uh, they affected me. Uh, in my shop in a pretty positive way to kind of follow this stuff. The most important thing is that all of you talk about it and you think about it every single time you iterate on your code. This is a constant conversation. Did complexity go up here? Maybe it went up here. Maybe it's time to break these things apart. Whatever you decide to do with these things, even if you do use two tildes every single time you went around, that's your, that's your prerogative. I would rather you make that decision consciously and every single time you think about it than to have not thought about it in the first place. That's really kind of the whole the whole purpose. This is what we came up with. It makes a lot of sense, and I think it's defensible. But at the end, this is really, it's an informed opinion, right? Like, these aren't rules. I'm not your code nanny. I would never be that. Um, 
or code authoritarian or whatever you want to call it. Whatever, I'm gonna avoid that word. <laughs> um, but um, I'm open to I'm open to questions right now. Like we covered so much ground. This is a big topic. Every single one of these slides could have been a talk in and of itself. And uh, I hope that maybe after this we can see maybe there's some more craftsmanship talks that that pop up now and then uh, around here. But yeah, man, so open up open up the floor. What do you guys? What keeps you up at night? What give, breaks you up in a cold sweat? High ass lock. Yeah. So a lot of this, not all of it, but like quite a bit of it seems objective or like based on experience. Because like someone who has a lot of experience gonna look at some code and be like, mm -hmm. this is terrible, you know, you couldn't use more good changes, you know. Mm -hmm. Someone who's Jewish, like me, you know, yeah. still gonna be like, this is beautiful, it works, right? Right. So a lot of these rules, like how do you how do you how do you be how do you find um, objective rules to apply them, I guess? Yeah, man. Well if objective rules and there aren't really objective rules it's almost like as if I was a composite music composition instructor I've been composing a lot of music and you're like I'm trying to produce this certain effect right I could say well it's a beautiful theme maybe you should make it in parallel six or uh, it's a march maybe two forward work and uh, three tends to be more fluid it doesn't work as well right or um, you know you you know you have these criteria these things you want to do and I can pull from experience I can tell you this uh, and I can make these rules. I can be like, well, two four is more rigid than three four. And like, these are kind of some general rules. But of course, you'll find you'll find ways to break them. That's okay. Um, I try to make these as general as possible. I try to say, like, try to observe volumetric patterns over branching. Sometimes you'll need to branch. And so, as much as I hate to say it, the real answer is a lot of it does come with experience. It comes with review. It comes with iteration, and that's okay. But at least by looking at this, you can start thinking of it as early in your career as possible. You had a slide yeah. uh, with a different answer to that question. Um, you mentioned some books and blogs. There's a lot of wisdom in, on the internet and in books. Not only clean code, mm -hmm. but also capturing the heart. Tyler's got, a, Tyler's got a few of those for more of an object oriented. I should add that to the list. The C2 wiki. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people on the internet, what you'll find is they've argued about these a lot. And so you can go read the arguments and how they came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really good answer. Uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, and the other thing is, like, you can read two masters. I can look at uh, Stravinsky's code, and I can look at Box code, and they're both uh, masters, but they're different. Um, so that's okay, too. Um, I am probably promoting a more functional way of thinking with JavaScript rather than a more strictly object-oriented, even though almost all these principles come from the object-oriented community. Like, most of them do, right? I, I really believe that there is not a panacea. There's no 100% right way. All you can do is become more agile in learning how to like untangle and make sense of what you're seeing. I'll, I'll tell you this, there, there is one thing I find myself saying at the shop all the time is refactor ideas before you refactor code. Like, we don't just jump in and start tearing it up, right? Like, it starts on the whiteboard. It starts with state flow diagrams. It starts like, well, I can do this in three steps. Can I do it in two steps? Should this thing live here? Maybe, maybe this object's doing too much work. Like, you can spend three or four days of planning, sharpening your axe, so to speak, and then poof, it's just over. And people get antsy. They're like, are you guys working in there? Yeah, we're not truckers. It's not like you're gonna ask us, you know, how, how many more miles do you have left? It doesn't work that way. This is, these are different kinds of problems. So you can't measure them the same way. Uh, so no, nothing against truckers. I just, they're easy to measure because they're halfway distance from another place and they've been traveling at this miles per hour. Um, you might make a breakthrough that saves your company literally thousands and thousands and thousands of hours and it's just you hanging out in the shower and you're like, oh, I should break that out. Boom, now you don't have to touch every single controller in your code base. It's that simple. So these are guidelines for things you can look for that are likely to sort of like collect complexity. Not always, but usually, you know, not all my ideas too. Is that a satisfactory answer? Because it's, sorry. <laughs> No, that's the thing. It's not right. Yeah. You know, it, all, it all feels like shifting complexity. It's like you want to like like your um, validation test. Mm -hmm. It's like either you handle that complexity like immediately, or you have a function that decides where it's going to like shift that complexity okay. to. Okay. Why would that one? Okay. Why would one be objectively more complex? That's a good question. Why would one be different? It's like I'm branching over here, and I maybe the branch calls other functions, right? Mm -hmm. So you got one file that's branching, a whole bunch of branches, right? You got a whole bunch of other files that's one function per thing. Why would that be more complex than something that just plugs them in? Because every time I add a new validator, I add another file to here, and I also go touch the branch again. I touch two files instead of one file. Like the pattern facilitates looser coupling. 
the pattern itself, the pattern, like you can weld this thing shut and never touch it again. Its only job is to plug stuff in and it will always do that. Um, you know, if, if your job is to plug things into the wall and you have to go look at an inventory first, or if I just say, just plug it, if it fits this criteria. The, number two is I can just set it and forget it, right? So you try to favor patterns that promote the sort of like, and like I said, we talked about cohesion for a really long time. We talked about coupling. Like you are constantly making trade-offs and you're trying to maximize it based upon what your application needs. Uh, no, no, it's okay. I, we were probably over at this point. Go. Yeah, some debt is, is good, right? I mean, it's better to mortgage a house than just keep renting it so you can save up enough money. So how do you decide how much technical debt is good versus, hey, spending all this time to make it a little more perfect might not be worth it the time investment? There's a graph. I'm glad you asked that. There's actually a graph about this, and it's like cost of chains versus technical debt. And it literally just looks like the uh, the back end of the, the Jesus fix you find on trucks. Okay. Will, you, will you turn this off? Yeah. No, 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 the uh, projector. Oh, yeah, I'll turn the projector off. Flashing blue. Um, the answer is, well, according to the masters, there is a law of diminishing return with it, right? That the cost of change will exceed the amount of technical debt you remove. Do it again. Gotta hit it twice. Yep. And um, so, you know, wh where is that? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> Hold up. Too slow? Two threads. Thank you. Thank you. Too slow. Uh, so, yeah, um, I think. Well, once your S-Lox hits 1,000, you've gone too far. Like there, you know, I gave you uh, general things that I've kind of discovered, like about 150 lines is kind of a lot, but like real caveat, like this isn't a hard, fast rule. And that's really one of those things too. It's like, um, I will say that um, very rarely have I come into a situation where thinking ahead and spending more time thinking ahead has resulted in, uh, the, it hasn't paid for itself. Like taking the time to set up the browser if I build made every project that much faster. Taking the time to set up, you know, testing. Testing is a huge, testing is more complicated than your environment, right? Like, it takes like 12 libraries just to get your testing harness up and going versus like the three to run your library. The only point is that there is a limit that you can't just keep fixing things and making them more perfect. There is, there is a limit, there is a limit. And so I hope that I express that there are some kind of low-hanging fruits, like using a module, using modern build system is low-hanging. Uh, there is some overhead, but it will pay for itself. Um, you know, and some of these things, um, it's like what Plato said, think of them up front as best you can. I'm not promoting waterfall or anything like that, for those of you who know. <laughs> what I'm saying is, um, if you put the linter in first, you don't have to go on a semicolon hunt later, right? If you put the complexity analysis in first, it never blows up in the first place. If you put the build system in first, you don't have to like do surgery after the fact. And so, I, of course, hindsight's 2020, right? Um, but the more that you can kind of anticipate up front. So that means, yeah, you might spend more time on the whiteboard, and then really take aim, and then it, everything works. But I think that um, it does not take a lot of work to throw a mattress in the swing. It, it is so, so easy, and folks will do it on accident, they don't mean to, but it just happens. Yeah, I I'm sorry. There's yes. also some, some point where you kind of know what bad is, yeah. and then there's a really wide area of pretty good. As long as you're out of the bad, and you're in the pretty good, you're in the right area, mm -hmm. and then you, Decide your own principles. Maybe they're not all the exact perfect principles, and maybe you have to change them later. If you know those principles, then when it comes to fixing a problem or building on that, since you have all the principles laid out, even if you're not perfect everywhere, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to find your problem faster. You're going to be able to add something on faster because you already have right. laid out yourself. No one's perfect. No one is a perfect cutter. No one can look at the code and automatically calculate all those metrics in their head and understand. It's just not possible. It's not. The human mind is not capable of hoisting that much at once. Uh, but we are capable of doing some kind of retrospective analysis and pulling things apart and really thinking of each individual piece. And so what you're saying is true. Uh, the important thing is, is as you're going, man, this doesn't feel right. We say code smell because it's like you're kind of sniffing it. Where could it lead you, right? Um, we can kind of categorize what they are so you can describe them. Like, if I said to you, this room is dim, right, that is not, there's not a value to that, right? Like, if I went to a dimmer and I just kept dimming the room and said, tell me when it becomes dim. Like, when is it going to, when is that, right? It's a, it's a descriptor that is relative to what? Other stuff in the room? Stuff you've seen in the past? Smell is like that, right? Like, smell is something that's going to be relative to your experience. It's going to be relative to other files in the project. It's going to be relative to kind of what other people in the industry are doing. And that's, that's okay. Um, but... Now you have ways to talk about it that are more descriptive so you can communicate to all the other developers that you're working with kind of how we might go about fixing it. Uh, so, yes, you're right. I'm just adding to it. <laughs> okay, sorry, Kristen. To kind of um, 
How do you get the leadership buy-in? I think one thing that a lot of us have been in the industry a lot longer is is people want things faster yeah. than, than they can really happen. And that's where a lot of technical debt kind of comes into play. And so for people that have been successful with this, how have they convinced leadership to give that additional you know, upfront time so you don't have the, the massive amount of technical debt? Because like, like you were saying, there is a point that's gonna be diminishing return um, for me, oftentimes it's going to be okay. Well, I've got a deadline. I've got to meet that. Um, but usually, when I give estimates, I'm also estimating. I'm trying to not create a lot of technical debt. But you may have someone else that provides estimates that are half the time, and you know it's going to cause huge amounts of technical debt. I was in that right. situation actually very, very recently, where something was like made to look really far along, and then it was wrong. It was hard to change. So. How do you get that that leadership buy-in, especially if you're in a shop that's kind of used to, like, let's just keep getting technical debt. Leadership doesn't even realize what it is. You could be very lucky and work. It's logical, by the way. We're hiring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, um, I, I am lucky to work at a shop that um, kind of understands. And this is not my idea. This is actually Ray's the person who taught me this. Taught the rest of the shop. Is if you kind of imagine a triangle of. You know, there's there's quality, right? And there's the amount of time that it, it takes you to complete it, and then there's sort of cost, and you get to sort of like pick two. Scope. PM's scope. dilemma. Scope. Okay, so cost, not money cost, but scope cost. I've heard there, I've heard the triangle in two different ways. Yeah. That there's kind of four different pieces, but uh -huh. it's like what you said, scope, but then costing go in there as well. Sure. Uh, yeah, I've seen it either way. But the yeah. point is, the point is, is you you want to. Tactically speaking, it makes more sense to lean on the side of quality, at the very least, right? Rather, you know, uh, because um, you don't want to rely on something that doesn't have high quality, right? You don't want to like, we need to set sail now and then have a brittle boat as you're out on the ocean, so to speak. And I, I think that it's not hard to communicate that idea. I, I mean, I think it extends to so many other domains, so many other ways of life that it's, it's intuitively true. Now, the question is, is as you're moving that diminishing return, Engineers tend to be pushing it more towards quality. Now that people want to kind of get it out the door faster, and um, but I will say that um, I have said this before, and I believe it. The phrase "we'll refactor it later" is code for "I don't give a crap how good this is." And so, just up front, just say like, "I hear I'll refactor it later." I hear that is code for "I don't care how good this code is," because how many people have said "I'll refactor it later"? Okay, surely you've said "I'll refactor it later" and you've gone back and done it at some point. But how many have done it more than 50% of the time you said it? <laughs> Do you always refactor it later? No. You know, but it's before it goes to production. Like, I'm trying something out. Oh, you're the only one that raised your hand. Later today. <laughs> <laughs> like, tomorrow. Later. Like, tomorrow. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, like okay, different context. Let's just get this out there. Let's get this making us money. We'll come back and clean it later. Yeah. Never happens. Yeah. So that's a that's team of six. You guys better remember, you guys would be authority. I mean, you guys are the experts when it comes to how long something's going to take. <laughs> what the quality of something is going to be. Now, you shouldn't be letting other people dictate you know, how much time it's going to take you to produce a quality product. You have to fight back. You have to stand your ground. You have to say, it's just not how it's done. We're the experts. We know how to code. We know how to do it right. We know how to build quality products. And if you want this amount of scope, this is the amount of time it's going to take. But you can't, you can't give way on quality. It's, it's just going to burn you later on. But stand up. You're, you're the authorities on this stuff. I agree. Thank you. That's right. Well, but they hired you because of If you were a doctor and someone said, but look, I really want to smoke, and you'd be like, I am literally, my job is to tell you this is going to kill you eventually. <laughs> like, I'm not going to make stuff up. Right. Right? No one's going to like it. Then why even go to you? Why even go to you? Like, if you're like condescending to the doctor, right? You the doctor. But if you're like, but what he's yeah. saying is you're the engineer. Yeah, if you should only yeah, if you're only allowed to drive a Lexus, why is there why is Key even exist? <laughs> then you have to ask them if the, are they a Lexus person or a Kia person? <laughs> like he just said there's no, he just said there, there can't be such a thing as a Kia person. He said you should you should ram a Lexus down somebody's I don't think that's true. I think I think what he's saying, and I agree with what he's saying, is um, if you expect a certain level of quality, like I build a house and it will do the job of a house, you can always find a lower bidder and it will eventually stop doing the job of the house because the quality has gone below a certain point. Now, there is something as gold plating, right? We don't want to gold plate. That's different. 
right? And I think that's what Adam was kind of alluding to earlier. But um, when we're talking about quality here, we're talking about stability, we're talking about non-brittleness, we're talking about agility to change. We're not talking about, that's a cool spinner, we spent a lot of money on it, or you know, this is really neat from our... Uh, so I wanna qualify the word quality, right? We mean like actual stability. Uh, and in that context, I mean, it's hard to disagree with what Ray said. I mean, he's right, you know? It's not a hard case to make. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. I'd add to, um, you know, like you said, with the doctor telling not to smoke, just because you, you're a doctor and you tell someone not to smoke doesn't mean they're going to go home and throw all their cigarettes away. They might still smoke. Right. But at least you, as a doctor, have gone in and you've checked off the box saying, I consulted this person not to do it. So if you don't have the, the decision making power, if you've got a boss who says, this is going to make us a million dollars tomorrow, we have to get this out, whether or not it's perfect or not, whether or not the code's reusable, you can say, well, we need to have this thing reusable eventually, I really believe it. Get it documented somewhere, even if they don't follow your rule, you have it down later on. Maybe you differentiate between a, a prototype and a product that's uh, really capable for mass production, right? Exactly. You say, this is a prototype. This is not for people to consume. This is just a kind of get It's always price. best to have it down somewhere if you have superior that says, this isn't where we want to be at the very end. We want to get further on. And I'm, the Could you make a sunset test that says like, hey, you need to refactor this code and it, it tests yeah, fails? Yeah, it's actually interesting that you say that. There are a lot of techniques that engineers have come up with that are really clever to um, enforce maintenance. Um, one of the ways they're doing it is uh, um, some folks at GitHub. Yeah, um, Emily Nakashima and Rachel Myers. Em yeah, Emily and Rachel have come up with sunset tests because it's easier to say we need to go repair this code because the code is broken rather than we want to go refactor jQuery. So there's a number of kind of techniques you can use to sort of like help in that department. So, okay. I have a feeling we're starting to clear out a little bit. So, thank you all for coming. Thanks for listening to my very long talk. <laughs>